Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich talks with community leaders about issues in the public safety arena, sponsored by River Ridge Hardware. Good afternoon, this is Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich with the Sheriff's Report. This is part two of a series that we're doing on the training that we developed within the, the Spokane County Sheriff's Office uh, by adapting some earlier training that um, the, our training director, Tony Anderman, who's in ser uh, studio with me today, uh, was part of uh, under a grant from the, the military. Uh, the, the project was the DARPA project in conjunction with Washington State University. And that's when you worked with uh, the Criminal Justice Training Commission Correct. Uh, for 21 years. Uh, you were there, and uh, we are very, very fortunate to be able to hire you and bring you in to uh, to help us with our, our training and write our curriculum and, and take us to that next level. So uh, the training that we're talking about today is our Interaction and Perceptions course. And we left off the last series talking about bias and, and you know are we really being effective in in changing that, that bias but before we get there let's talk about how we deliver the training to the deputy and then we'll slowly work towards are we actually having that impact that was intended uh, Sheriff, you, you mentioned a very good topic uh, just briefly before we get in there. How do we know? How do we know we're changing that? And we're going to talk about that research that was done out of New York PD and what's going on in that and, and a lot of work being done. So, yes, we will definitely talk about that. So how are we delivering as an organization? How are we delivering this course, a 16-hour course, to our new deputies? Um, it starts out with adult learning, student-centered. How are we going to get that buy-in by that adult? We do not lecture to them. Um, we make sure that there's very clear left and right parameters. There's there's a lot of uh, material that they have to move through. We discuss it. When I say discuss, uh, we facilitate with them in small teams. And uh, through this course, we also introduce them slightly to stress. And Sheriff, you and I have talked about this. By in introducing or inducing stress onto an adult in any environment, we know that the biometrics kick in and there's 35 to 38 different chemicals that dump into the body. And there's different things that occur within the body, and we, we call that freeze, fight, or flight. And that's one of the things I think that in a sterile environment of, of the next day, when you're analyzing what happened during a situation, people forget about and legislators had never experienced that and activists may have never experienced it either uh, they they get to sit in a sterile environment and and you know basically Monday morning quarterback some of the things that, that happen within the realm of law enforcement and the way we we do our our jobs they don't take into a fact that that is a physiological process that is uncontrollable. Correct. Automated. And you have to learn how to toggle between all those chemicals that are taking you from your thinking brain to your reactionary brain, which that's, that's how it's divided. That's how we function as humans. Correct. And you, we have to literally try to teach people to toggle back and forth. Uh, because that reactionary brain I, can actually save your life, but you have to be able to think your way through it also. So it's a, a, a very interesting dynamic when you're trying to teach somebody to overcome the body's natural, physical, chemical makeup that is driving you a different way. Correct. Emotional cognition, and that's what we're discussing. And I'm assuming that's going to be a whole different uh discussion in the future but well, as a matter of fact i think we'll bring you back in january and we'll have a discussion about that class how do we wrap that into a classroom environment and why do we do that and here's why and we can talk about i've talked to many uh, deputies including yourself sheriff, sheriff where you guys can remember a critical incident like it was yesterday and when i say that is there's very key points within that critical incident that you can bring back to light from the smell the lights uh, you know, if it was sun, if the sun was up, what part of the uh, sky was the sun? 
Um, so why is that? Why is it that you can remember that environment? We bring it back to the research is showing that under stress, under these certain conditions, because of the adrenaline and because of the different chemicals that go through your body, you remember that. So how do we capture that and put that into a classroom environment and take, say, for example, a three-week course and narrow it down to a two-day course because we're capturing those emotions? And it's a two-edged sword, Tony. The two-edged sword is we may remember certain aspects yes but because we get everything starts narrowing into that that extreme problem we may not have seen something over here well and you've said. you've talked about how going through this class you'll have them go out and make contacts and they are so focused on trying to do this right that they won't notice somebody that's six three that's jumping up and down walk by them they won't even notice that that individual's there. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. And I'm glad you brought up that point because, yes, it's not the full detail of the situation. There's key moments within that situation that they can remember. So how can we get them to do that in a classroom setting to remember key points within the class by introducing to them to some stress? And I'm saying you stresses, which is a positive stress, which in most cases adults will then take into a negative stress. So... Once this occurs, or as you well said, the logic side of the mind, we want them to logically think through the process. But because of the stress, their emotions kick in, then get kicks into uh, their cognition, which um, I guess short circuits the logic here and there, right? Yeah, you actually flip to the primal side of the brain. And again, folks, this is, this is scientifically proven. This is how the human brain developed. And that's who we are. And, right. And you have to, the hardest part, Tony, is I think for the training of this and for officers to realize is when you're going up yourself, yes. when your emotions are starting to spike. Yes. And that's, and, and that's another good point, Sheriff, is that's what we attempt to do in this classroom as we help them understand that their emotional intelligence, their emotions are now getting in the way of their logical thought process. How do they pull out the policy? Uh, different things that we have them memorize, for, for example, just within an hour before that introduction to a role play. They realize, oh my, I can't just recall things immediately under this type of a stress. I have to slow myself down. I have to look at the environment differently. So with that introduction of stress, we then talk about biometrics, kinesics, and proxemics. And what does that mean? We talked about the physiological uh, effects of biometrics and what that looks like. Kinesics is body language. How does the deputy or officer react under stress, and how do they show their body language to others? But by us helping them recognize their own body language, we help them recognize others. So by them recognizing their own, we help them recognize others. Proximics, how, how far away do we stand from somebody? How close do we stand somebody? If we approach somebody, proximally push, do they push away from us? Do they walk away or step back? What does that look like? So we teach them these key things so when they're having a social interaction with somebody, they start looking for baseline and anomalies. Problem-based learning is where we put the individuals into a problem-based scenario, may it be active or in, in writing. Uh, peer team-led learning is where we actually have a content expert sitting at the table from the department leading a small team. Peer-oriented guided learning, Sheriff, that's a way where we actually hand over the leadership to that young deputy and have them lead their own team. And in turn, they start feeling that stress as if they're doing something wrong, and we coach them through it. Role play? Who likes role playing? Not too many adults in law enforcement like role playing, but we have to do that to help them learn how to decenter, take up somebody else's, we almost say, we'll say, uh, fitting into somebody else's shoes. So we'll give them a culture to research and play so they can understand that culture a little bit better. Journaling, how do we take these emotions and put them in writing? How do we actually have them capture what they learned that day or that moment and start reflecting personally and put it in writing? We do this in our field training officer car as well. How do we reflect on that day? And we have them write down what they've learned, how they're going to do better the next day or the next hour, and what they want to learn further. Community engagements, this is where we take them out into the community sheriff and we actually have them engage with strangers. Um, we literally will pick somebody out who is completely different than them. 
Um, at the beginning of the course, we would just go, okay, Sheriff, go pick somebody out to talk to. They would literally walk up to somebody who looked just like you, meaning myself. I'll find somebody who looks like me. Don't get out of our comfort level. Uh, exactly. Um, so we thought, no, we better start picking individuals so they can approach individuals that are completely different than them. And then how do we measure all, all you know, success? How do we measure that something's happening with the student? We use a rubric and that rubric's tied into the competencies and those competencies are tied back into the DARPA project, the research. So we know that through this rubric that if we start observing, say, Sheriff Ozzy Knezovich having an interaction with a stranger and they're meeting these competencies, we can hand that back and have a coaching session with them and go, okay, here's where you're at. If we have a video from afar, watching the body language, we can actually have them come back and look at that video and evaluate themselves based on this rubric. So that's, that's a delivery of the course. So as we, as we move in, so what are the move closer into the goals? How do we actually know that, uh, let me back up, what direction do we wanna go with the course, Sheriff? So as, as we move through on uh, slide 10, articulate what implicit and explicit biases are how they are dis uh, distinct from each other and how they work and how their relevance are to policing. Key there, the next, the next one, the yellow box, I'm colorblind, so forgive me. Gain awareness of how implicit and explicit biases may impact the behavior of self and others, and that's what you've talked about, is when that stress hit, more importantly, even if there's not stress there, how do their own implicit and explicit biases affect others? And how do we help them recognize that, again, through multiple different activities, we get them to help them recognize, A, we do have biases. What does that look like and how does that affect others and ourselves? Articulate what implicit or explicit biases may encounter or he or she may encounter or in a community member during a uh, special social interaction based on observation or assessment. So specific social interaction based on observation or assessment. So we get them into a conversation with a stranger they walk away and they, they say, yeah, this was great. I had a great conversation. Well, guess what you were talking about? Guess what your body language said? And I would walk up to that stranger and say, here's who I am. I work for the sheriff's office. What do you think about what we're doing? They're surprised, one, and then how do you think that conversation went? In most cases, it's completely opposite of what the deputy's saying it was. Uh, uncomfortable. The stranger will say they looked uncomfortable. They were sweating. They were nervous. They were pacing around. The deputy would say, yeah, I felt very comfortable. I stood still. Well, here's what they said. Here's what you said. So we can help them understand that what was creating that nervousness? What was that story you were thinking about while you were talking with the individual? What were the biases? And, and let's face it, one of the more uncomfortable things that, a, that we do as humans is what? Meet somebody new. Yes. Engage somebody that we do not know. And, um, you know, it, that's already uncomfortable, but when you put the added stress on, you're, you, you have to go do this, you have to go make that contact, and then there's things that we're evaluating. We're, we're just stacking that stress level on them and in hopes that they can navigate through that and learn to manage that emotion. That's a good point. Emotions versus robotic behavior, right? How do we show them our real self, the community? When they put their uniforms on, we have them make contact, Sheriff. They're more robotic. Mm -hmm. They gain their trust, meaning they gain their uh, confidence back as an individual. But what they lose is that human ability to talk with somebody. They immediately go into this interrogation mode with the pad up in their hand, and they start asking these questions they learned in an academy. What we want them to discover is if you're just making a social contact, you can still be tactically sound, but at the same time be a human being. You exactly. don't have to stand at a bladed stance all the time. You don't have to have the pad in front of you start taking notes. You're having a conversation, and you're trying to go through a process with that stranger to learn who they are, and they can discover that you're a trustful individual through that process. So as we move further into page or uh, slide 11, Sheriff, we have uh, some more goals that are continued. Have heightened awareness and appreciation for culturally effective greetings. I don't think we teach this in the academy. I, again, 20 years, I don't think we teach how to effectively greet uh, a member of our community that may be Ukrainian or Korean. Um, what's that look like? And how do we discover that? If we don't know what it is, how do we discover that? Well, if I approach a Ukrainian family, for example, I learn through that process. So the next time I approach another Ukrainian family, I will now know how to approach them, how to greet them appropriately using possibly some key phrases that I might learn. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And people don't, I don't think, Tony, people don't realize how how important that is because even with within different cultures, there not everybody gets along. You know, I'm I'm Slavic, and not all all, all Slavic people like other Slavic people. We, we, you know, you have Croatians, you have Serbians, you have um, Poles, the whole gambit. And there are there are let's call them tribal rifts that happened centuries, millennia ago, that have never been forgotten. And you can really cross up by thinking that you're you're okay talking a certain way so that that cultural aspect is probably the hardest thing for a a law enforcement officer in the united states to navigate because we are a nation of multi cultures completely agree and that's where when we look at the seven comp- competencies, Sheriff, when we look at that repair and adapt or adapt and repair, that's where we, if we approach a culture that for whatever reason they're feeling uncomfortable with us, what are we doing as an individual and how do we adapt and repair our own approach and our own engagement to help them feel more comfortable with us? Again, keeping a tactically sound environment. We still have to be in control of what the environment looks like so that way people are safe. But at the same time, how do we still gain that trust with that individual or with that culture? Um, have heightened awareness and appreciation for culturally effective communication behaviors related to specific lo- local populations. I think we discussed that fairly well. Um, slide 12, increase self-awareness and social awareness. Increase self-awareness and social awareness. Emotional intelligence, right off the bat. If I'm not aware of my social or my own awareness, my social and emotional awareness, how am I affecting others with that? Are they seeing us as that arrogant individual? Um, or are they seeing us as that very approachable individual, but I still have to be tactically sound? I'm still polite, I'm still professional, and I'm still attempting to gain trust. Or that brand new rookie who is really robotic. Yes. I'll tell you just a quick story, Tony. I was in the training car, making contact with somebody. If he'll stand next to me, and the, the person we were making contact had a gun sitting with him right outside of a bar now kind of a little bit more high stress contact Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely but i learned something that i've never forgotten that day um the guy looked at me and went you're new aren't you because i was doing what i was a robot Uh, i learned that day that you know just go back to the to being a human and and make that contact a little bit different I would say that uh, the courses that I've taught, the research that I've had the opportunity to be a part of, the mentorship through Washington State University and Dr. Brian Violet, it boiled down to that conversation. Just be human. Again, we all make mistakes, we all have biases, but just be human and adapt and correct your behavior on the fly in order to continue to create that trust environment. And and again, I have to say is, you and I are not sitting here saying, we're, we're going to drop the tactics. What we're saying is still be the human being and have the empathy for the individuals in front of you. And even if you had to use force, you still have empathy after the use of force, right? You still are professional to them. Been there in that situation, uh, involved in a foot pursuit with somebody, having to take them down, handcuffs. But by the time we walked back to the residence, we were swapping jokes and I had his full confidence and we there was no issues Uh, just because you know somebody we at times don't factor in that the other side's human too correct you know we we sling the label and we can't do that we have to remember that yeah even even that person that just broke the law they're still human and they are entitled to the same human responses that is correct couldn't have said it better have heightened awareness of indicators of potential implicit biases in self and others during the encounter we talked a lot about that about the heightened heightened awareness recognize and articulate the importance of improving adapting and overcoming difficulties with contacts increasing the ability um, to adapt or repair tactical complexities within a social interaction wow 
that's a lot. So increasing the ability to adapt or repair to tactical complexities within a social interaction. What can we actually define as a tactical complexity within a social interaction, Sheriff? What's, what would be considered a tactical complexity? It goes back to the, to the, the scenario where you're engaging somebody. They may be up here a little, and you're trying to talk them down, but you're so focused on trying to talk them down that you're not noticing that they're holding a knife. And that can happen. I've watched it happen that people get, get so tied up with trying to get things back down that they're no longer paying attention to the environment they're in. And uh, that, can, that can cause escalation issues. And we know that stress is involved. We know, and yes, a lot is involved in that whole situation right there. As we move on to the next slide, and we'll finish off with the goals here, Sheriff, of the Interactions and Perception course, demonstrate the ability to adapt to implicit and explicit biases observed in self and others during a counter. Observed in self, in self. You and I both know that if we don't teach our new deputies, including uh, more mature deputies, like how I said that, more mature deputies, to look at themselves. Because as new deputies, they're just trying to do the job. And we consider them deputies that their, their competence is mi minimal there. But we're trying to build their confidence through the competence training. Well, if you, you go back to our values, Tony, and, you know, as an agency, everything we do wraps back to the values. Correct. Everything we develop, every policy we develop, every training aspect we develop goes back to the values. You know, the ground floor is honor, which means integrity and all, the, all those things. And quite frankly, we don't highlight that. We don't hang that so much up, up on the board because, quite frankly, if we didn't hire you with that, we made a mistake. Yes. You should come with all that, the integrity, the character, and everything else. You know, uh, the next step is the training. We have to train them. And we have to educate them, and we have to be innovative in, in how we do all of these things that leads to them being competent. Yes. Because if they're competent, they're going to be confident. Yes. And you will never de-escalate anyone if you are not both. Agreed. And through that process, understanding the training, the importance of it, and our program, you and I have talked about this uh, last few days. I just got a report, what was it yesterday, the day before, Sheriff? It was yesterday, I believe. Yesterday, Lori Friedel, the CEO of Fair and Partial Policing, trained 36,000 sworn personnel in 2018 at a New York Police Department. Um, using similar foundation tools that we have and others have. Uh, within, that, um, within that research project, what they're showing is that within that context, I think it's 12 hours or eight hours. I'd have to go back. And, um, and Vinny, if you could throw up uh, slide 14. So within that context and the timing and the research, what they're showing through this research and teaching bias, uh, fair and impartial policing, they're showing that they can change the minds of the deputy or police officer. But for whatever reason, the behaviors are not fully being changed out on the street. They compared five other courses with that training to show that others are doing that. And Sheriff, our course, um, the Interactions and Perceptions course out of Spokane, our organization was one of the five in Washington State University's, uh, Dr. Lois James was one of the, uh, her course, the Counter Bias Training Simulation course was compared as well. And it was very, very favorable of what we were doing in the county. And, and that just speaks to the, you know, the, great job you've done taking us to that level you know, that our training is now being bounced off of training at the largest law enforcement agency in the United States NYPD and you know a lot of people like to to give NYPD uh, you know a, ba a bad rap sometimes but I will tell you that I've met many uh, people from NYPD and I've met many of their leadership and they take this very, very seriously. And they take ethics very, very seriously. So it, it's kind of, a, kind of an honor that they, you know, throughout this process that this, this, 
this team that we actually got uh, compared again against the training that they're providing them um, at the and at the NYPD. So we're we're moving forward. And Correct. I'm again. I'm going to bring you back in, in January. We'll talk about the emotional side and a little bit more on the bias side. But going back to the question that I posed at the end of the last, the first segment. How do we know that we're actually affecting the bias aspect? Sheriff, I, I think the only way we're going to get to bottom of this is continue doing the work, for example, what Lori Friedel is doing, continue doing the work that we're doing, continue doing the work that Washington State University is doing, and many leaders in the area of research of providing that content, that delivery, that will help that organization better the organization, better the culture, better the deputy, to help better the, the community. To do that, obviously, it's funding, right? It's, it's funding to do that research. It's, it's support from the community, support from the leaders, but it takes time. So is that the future? That, that is the future, yes. Um, wh where do we want to go in the future, Sheriff? I mean, our goal is to rewrite the, the basic academy. We want to set a model academy for the future. Um, we want to use a third party to do our job task analysis to tie, tie into the academy. Um, we want to bring in um, neurological dynamics and the learning research. We also, to assist with that development, we want someone to audit our content, just like we talked about, continue all this great research and place those tools and skills in that research. Um, research the outcomes, establish a national and international accreditation, and then continuously, continuously, continuously audit our faults, audit our gaps, and correct what we're doing so that way we can we can move forward because we're not perfect but we want to get there we want to be that great organization but we need the help of others exactly and, and quite frankly tony we've offered the washington state criminal justice training commission to do this for them uh, that was the whole idea of us presenting our academy material to them was we're willing to rewrite your entire curricula bring it up to to speed because it's still Last we heard, we're still running off of 2014 materials in the academy. Rewrite it all, bring it to them, and, and take uh, the entire state to, to the next level. That is and correct. the offer's still there, um, and that is where I think we really need to push and really need to get to. And the focus is, as you said, make this agency for this community the best that we can make it and that is the goal public trust is the end, end game of our values correct and hopefully through the training we provide the service we provide we will always maintain because you know, based on the polling our community does trust uh, the law enforcement within this region and I'm very very thankful for that and I'm very very protective of that folks this is Sheriff Ozzie Knezovich with the Sheriff's Report I look forward to seeing you uh, after the, the first of the year. We're going to start doing a series of, of shows uh, in the next couple of weeks, wrapping this year up, and we'll talk to you later. Have a nice day. Thanks for watching. Ask the host a question, recommend a guest, or check out any of our other programs on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Spokane Talks Media. Com. Sponsored by River Ridge Hardware. Hi, Larry Myers again at River Ridge Hardware. Um, back in our garden center, it's changed a little bit. We have lots of greenery though. We have Christmas trees at $39.99. We have pretty much everything you'd ever want in Christmas. The icicle lights from white to straight blue to multicolor. I have these cute little shelf snowmen. One of the cool things that we have at River Ridge Hardware, which may be one other in the United States, is a full a custom picture framing shop and all kinds of Christmas decor that you can decorate your tree. Go on our website at riverridgehardware.com Feel free to call us at 509-388-2000. Uh,
328-0915. We're still offering curbside delivery and delivery outside the neighborhood within a five mile radius with just a purchase of $25 or more. So let us help you in this shopping time. Shop local, shop often, and have a Merry Christmas.